Holy God, we, your people, stand ready to embrace your Spirit. Send it down upon us that our hearts and minds are open. Guide my thoughts and my speech that they may be pleasing to you. O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So, back in my more conservative days, and I was first coming to the UCC, I heard a pastor preach on Jezebel. And he preached on all the wonderful things that Jezebel brought to the community and that got transferred into the church. I had a fit. All the way home, poor Patty heard a mouthful from me. What kind of church elevates Jezebel? Why, Jezebel is... Okay. I've come to understand. This is a caveat. I am not the spokesman for God. I am not the mouth of God. I'm not even a word of authority. I am a teacher who has been placed by all of you into this place to hopefully educate and maybe prompt some thoughts, and even though they may be unpleasant or challenging, um, they might have an opportunity for understanding and growth. And so with that, I am not trying to tear down. I'm trying to build up. If what I say is like, John, you're full of it, I'm full of it. And go on your merry way, be as gentle as a dove. Okay? So, with that said, you're probably like, oh my gosh, what's John going to preach about? <laughs> Sorry, I, one of my suspenders is slipping down my arm. I, oh, I feel for our, our uh, lovely uh, female... <laughs> Uh, people in the congregation that... Okay, there it goes. All right. Sorry. Uh, so. Happy Father's Day. Now, I will admit that in some of my religious circles, it's hard to say that and then just let it stand. There's always some sort of explanation or condition and it, it doesn't stand as a church greeting. And because of that, some people blame it falsely on woke culture. And if any of you have questions on woke culture, look at my sermon from Pentecost. So right now, I am just offering Happy Father's Day whatever that means to you. And at the start of the service, I asked you to sit with these words and consider what they mean to you. Right now, I'm asking you to consider what they mean to Western society and world order. Now I'm going to be, expand beyond Happy Father's Day, and I'm just going to say, Our Father. What does that mean? How does that make you feel? How does that sit with you? Who art in heaven? Now, for many of you, including myself, these words are familiar, comforting, reassuring. But there's also a truth that for many, these words are limiting, painful, 
disenfranchising. And it makes me very sad that father has become a very difficult word in our society. There are expectations. There are reputations on it. Limitations. Pain. And especially coming as a father myself. But in another way, it makes me happy that we stop and we talk about this, that it has become difficult. It means that some of the old ways are being rethought and being challenged, which means exposing past wrongs and hurts. And this doesn't mean blame. It doesn't mean guilt. It just, it's like when we do our um, prayer of release. It just means, you know, we can do better. So, and I, being a father myself, I am not slamming fathers. In fact, there are many exceptional fathers in all shapes, relationships, and identities. But the word father is so loaded, I thought we could spend some time just looking at fathers. I had a priest in my my youth, who was also a prison chaplain. And on Father's Day, he would note that the prisoners he would minister to, he would always run out of Mother's Day cards. Father's Day cards, he was pressed if he could give one away. And that always stuck with me. So, Firstly, Father's Day is only 113 years old. Probably as old as Abraham. In the, the way we know it in the U.S. In other countries, especially some of the Catholic European countries, it's celebrated on March 19th because of Joseph. That's St. Joseph's Day. Our celebration was started in Washington State by somebody named Sonora Smart Dodd in 1910, and this was formed two years after Mother's Day in 1908. And we have to remember the other countries started it as sort of a religious observance. Uh, Mother's Day is always held during May, which is devoted to Mary. So both Mary and Joseph are sort of held up as ideals in uh, in the Catholic household. But here it started as sort of a secular uh, celebration. And it was meant to connect with Mother's Day celebration and um, sort of elevate the presence of fathers in uh, turn-of-the-century America. As I mentioned before, one of the most uh, familiar uses of father is in the prayer, Our Father. Or sometimes it's known as the Jesus Prayer or the Prayer of Our Savior. But our father is an English translation of the words potter noster. And I'm going to use the term uh, potter. Potter being Latin for father. Although the way Jesus was using it, it wasn't so much father, it was Abba. Sort of like Papa. And so this is why sometimes when I'm reciting our prayer, uh, I'm kind of slow to say creator, okay? because <laughs> I would stop dead cold in my tracks if my kid called me a creator. said, creator, may I borrow the car? <laughs> but I understand the need for that word because father has become such a symbol of oppression. And unfortunately, English does not have a neutral term of endearment for a parent. In fact, I would almost rather say mommy at the beginning of that prayer because it conveys the intimate nature and it's also radically shocking for the people at that time, for Jesus to call God, Abba, the unmentionable Hashem, the name, to call him Daddy, to call God daddy, to call her mommy. 
radical. And those are the nature of those words. But back to Potter. So the Latin name Potter is important because it makes my sentence title make sense. This is what it's called Harry Potter and the Empire of Lies. And it's a play on the Harry Potter books and the movies. Okay, so Harry Potter. Um, actually, when I was talking about this, um, this uh, sermon with my, my son, he's like, oh, Dad, you should undo your hair for this. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> I waved, I waved my, my braid uh, at Pentecost, and that, I think that's enough. You don't need the full Harry pastor. So, um, so Harry Potter is a reference to Jupiter, or if you want to go back earlier, to Zeus, sky god, father king, big beard, flowing hair. If you've seen the new uh, Little Mermaid uh, movie, Ariel's father is Triton. He kind of looks like that same Harry Potter. And it comes from Ju, which means day, and Potter, Jupiter, Jupiter. Okay, so you get that all together. Sky Father. And it's important that we consider this Greco Roman Sky Father in our modern world because we're still dealing with the toxic legacy of this today. The ancient Hebrew worship of Hashem, which just means the name, it's God. I don't, I don't particularly like calling God Jehovah or, or Yahweh because it's, it's, it's a pronunciation of an unpronounceable name. And so I like the name Hashem, which just means the name. And though it's patriarchal, the ancient Hebrew tradition was patriarchal in worship, and it had a hereditary priesthood, Hashem has been coded in the West with an angry authoritarian Jupiter varnish that needs stripping and refinishing to open our eyes to the true beauty of God. Isaiah said so. Jesus said so. I'm not saying anything new. Sky Father King dominates with blessings and punishments at a whim. Sky God should be faithful to his favorites. For example, a demigod son, Hercules, could also be notoriously unfaithful to his spouse, Hera or Juno. Humans had better watch out. Sky Father is unpredictable. Unpredictable is a lightning bolt. Favorite weapon. And as I mentioned, Jesus pointed out that Empire, Sky Father, is not our living God. The complex world of ancient Greek city-states and the domination of the Roman Empire <laughs> fused together with a Persian dualism and then Judaic monotheism made first century theology interesting and a place for Jesus to take hold and a movement to take hold. You have to think that in the first century everything had sort of a Greek flavor and then on top of that this Roman empire I like to think of it as Hellenistic Greece is sort of the meal, and Rome is the plate, a structured plate. Each little compartment for food. And most importantly, you better not break that plate because you won't have any food. So the Roman Empire had a distinct brand, Pater Familius, head of the household, the Dominum, and it was defined by the emperor, and there was this thing known as the pater familias, which was the social order of the ideal family. Father was strong, obedient, kept the order in his household. Then there was his domina, his wife, the mistress of the house. And the domine were surprisingly strong. There were some very strong Roman emperor uh, wives, empresses like Julia, but they submitted to the power of the dominum, the lord of the house. 
And these domina had more power than Athenian women who were just sort of locked away, kept in darkness. So the idea of patri, the pat- patriarchy, took form and, in my opinion, injected a toxicity into the church as empire transformed itself to the church. You know, we look at the epistles of Paul and he has all these little setups of women need to be quiet, women need to submit themselves, women need to, to uh, behave a certain way, dress a certain way. And those weren't all Paul. There were other authors pretending to be Paul. But, you know, even when Paul and Pseudo-Paul and Deutero-Paul and Third Paul are writing, these writings have a subversive slant. Because it does say women submit yourselves, but it also says husbands honor your wives with, even with your body. Ancient Romans don't talk like that. So there is a subversion in it that we don't really recognize because it's like a little too, too little. So you get all of this Roman Greek stuff, filter it through Augustine, Aquinas, Gregory the Great, even Calvin, Luther, Knox. Then you add the whipped cream of the Victorian cult of motherhood found in Queen Victoria's personal life and her exemplary model of mother of empire and devoted wife of, to Albert and her family, even after his death. And then we get mid-20th century popular white suburban culture. Bing! The cherry. And this is what I call the empire of lies. All of this put together. His father knows best, Ozzy and Harriet, Mike Brady on the Brady Bunch. All of this can take... <laughs> contributes to the toxic nature of what a father is, what a father could be. Rules, expectations, formulas. To quote an expert, whited sepulchers full of rot and decay. Because under all of these beautiful lawns and manicured houses, Ricky Nelson was drug-dependent. Mrs. Brady and Greg were having a fling. Darren Stevens and Mr. Brady were forced into the closet along with Uncle Arthur. I watch too much TV. But, so much for the history lesson. This is where it comes alive. God is about possibilities, not limitations. In our first reading this morning, we find Abraham and Sarah welcoming guests. And I love it when he says, in the heat of the day, I think of this time of year and how hot it is. And finally, guests show up. You want to say, oh no, not guests. Go away. But no, he welcomes them. Yes, Father Abraham acting in a dominant position but there's also Sarah who's welcoming too. And this story is not possible without Mother Sarah. There's no hospitality with minus either of them and their servants. We also have to put the servants in. They're equals. And these strangers, whether interpreted as angels or God, give hope, a dream fulfilled, a promise of flourishing, a wholeness for both Sarah and Abraham. God of possibilities, not limitations. This is so unlikely for them that it makes Sarah laugh. And I like how the message highlights that Abraham is an old man. You have to think that probably their romantic life has slowed down a bit. You also have to remember it's a time before modern pharmaceuticals and blue pills and the like. We also have to remember that Abraham (laughs) is said to be very old when Isaac was born, but we need to take it that that's not literal. I mean, 100 years, that is old. But it means that even though he has great age, he's still moving with God and moving with Sarah in a new way of being. 
And blue pills or not, there is a stamina for physically moving everything you own across the desert in a caravan. So Sarah's laugh of disbelief isn't just mocking. It's an affirmation. It's an affirmation of God shalom working with them. And they eventually name Isaac after her laughter. So here we have limitless God. God not held back by anything. Just have to welcome. But now in the 21st century, we again have public people trying to impose Harry Potter and the Empire of Lies. Only certain people can have children. Men have to behave a certain way. Women have to be, behave a certain way. Everything is clear and split down the middle. We hear calls about a lazy and delusional young generation. Men won't work, who won't form relationships with young women, who are refusing to make a new era of Ozzy and Harriet and Father Knows Best. In this world, young women cannot have a purpose outside of Harry Potter. In this world, feminism is killing a generation by keeping them from motherhood and marriage. All of these are false narratives because our youth, like all youth, the youth of this generation are growing and working and forming relationships just fine. I'll quote another expert. The expert said, I'm making something new. Can't you see it? But that'll be for next week. <sighs> My sadness is that, like many of you, I would even venture to say most of you, I remember the quote-unquote good old days. I remember playground bullying. I remember both receiving it and giving it. I remember boys and girls being forced into stereotypical roles. I remember myself being given a very hard time for being the only boy in a sewing class in middle school. Now, I didn't learn much. I sew horribly. I also remember the heavy tolls that were placed on men to be wage earners, never crying, never complaining, and often taking to bottles and cigarettes to cope. As I do genealogy online, I see how many men in, in all families, all both sides, died from heart attacks in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. How many women were discouraged from finding their careers or their real selves and were forced into the home by Harry Potter standards? Many of you remember that up until the 70s, even in some cases up till the 80s, women could not have credit in their own name and were often identified by their husband's name. I remember my mother was Mrs. Patrick J. Angelo. When my children were little, Patty was the main income person. <laughs> I graduating with a degree in art history and she with a degree in nursing she was able, able to bring in the, the larger income. And I was perfectly fine with that. And one of my fraternity brothers, I remember when, when I wrote him a check, Patty's name was on top of the check, mine was under it. He goes, ha ha, she's got her name on top. I'm like, who cares? And I was on that cutting edge of what was known and is no longer really used very much, but Mr. Mom. Since Patty worked at night and she was the main income getter, I took the kids to school 
I usually got the food together. Sometimes McDonald's. I was the classroom dad. And it would pee my boat. When the principal would say, classroom moms, we're so happy that you're volunteering. And I would sit in the back, and dad. I would drive to field trips. Thank God. Thank God. I work at the Presidio, and they have school field trips, and half of those people are dads. Abundance, not scarcity. The other thing that's very freeing is as my role here as crying pastor uh, that I've, I've been affirmed by so many of you because it really does bother me when I, when I start breaking down. But many of you said, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that gift. I remember when my grandfather died in 1975, and I was 12, so many people came up to me and said, you have to be strong. Don't cry. You are now, you have to take care of your grandmother. A 12-year-old boy. The B.S. of Harry Potter and the Empire of Lies. So, we now have a new resurgence of Harry Potter, even though he faded for a bit. There's a resurgence. And there are talks of false virtues. Of what is masculine? What is feminine? Why, masculine is fortitude, industry, craftsmanship, Warrior impulse, provider, passion, giving. And of course, women are naturally nurturing, have patience, receiving. They take care of the household. They care. I've even heard some say, they tame men and bring them to religion. So thank you, ladies. We all know this isn't true. There are women, and I would say it is feminine to have fortitude in industry and craftsmanship and to be a warrior, a provider, passion. You know, you hear this term mother bear all the time. That is warrior. And I would even say, don't even classify it as Amazon or whatever. It is just, if there is a warrior impulse, that's it. Men, nurturing, patience, receiving, household care, taming women. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? <laughs> Bringing people to religion. What is that? What is that? These are gifts. These are gifts given to all of us freely, no matter who we are or where we are on life's journey, free of identity. Free of gender, humanity, the face of the living God. So what is the answer? Jesus. We just saw in the Gospel. Jesus' way is the way against empire and Harry Potter. It's a way of liberation from oppression. Authentic living, kicking out demons, healing. We see Jesus sending his disciples out to heal and preach, encounter people where they are, how they are, being authentic, traveling light, not burdened with things like baggage and dogma. Encountering people where they live, not imposing, not limiting, not rejecting them and going on to social media to destroy them, or making a podcast and characterize them as the end of Western civilization. People don't accept your message. Shake the dust off. Move on. There's healing to do. Hope to raise. Love to spread. 
This is one of my favorite quotes in all of the Bible when Jesus said, Be as gentle as doves, but cunning as serpents. And he is talking by tradition. I don't think it's, it's true because I think there were women in the, the group. To men, gentleness, kindness, doves. But cunning as serpents. Why, who is beguiled by a serpent in a garden? Be wise. Serpents are wise. And they're also portrayed often as a feminine trait. Be shrewd. As I tell people, you know, be kind, but don't be a dope. You know? Share love. Move in the way of Jesus. See Christ, be Christ. You know, it's funny because later on in the book of Acts, I don't remember Paul telling Lydia, the first quote-unquote European to be baptized, and her whole household too, uh, go get a man because your household is incomplete without a man. Or telling Priscilla, one of the early leaders of the church, uh, you know what, you better be quiet and get your husband Aquila to come start talking. And I'm not even going to mention about Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Susanna. The point is, embrace who you are, where you are on life's journey. Harry Potter and the Empire of Lies shall not pass. To quote Gandalf, another Harry Potter. So be authentic who you are. Father, mother, both, neither, papi, mommy, booby, uncle, aunt, binary, non-binary. God is calling all of us to laugh. To laugh as we consider the realities and the possibilities of a life full of love. Harry Potter and the Empire of Lies is ending. But I hear God's book of life just keeps opening new chapters all the time. So, from my heart, happy Father's Day and whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs>